All right. Good morning, everybody. As usual, let's wait for five minutes. Hope everyone's morning is fine and cool and dandy. Do, 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 do. People are popping up in the chat. Hello, people. Give me a second. I need to make an official announcement everywhere. Everyone. Let's go. Oh. People are coming. Good. Little by little. How's everyone doing? Everyone doing fine? Hello, beautiful faces. Or nicknames. Oh, yeah. Before I forget, Vin, if you are in the chat, Say hello so I can make you a mod. Because last time we were attacked by evil spammers and we couldn't do anything about it. <laughs> um, yeah. Hello, hello, everybody. How's your Wednesday? Little by little? Yesterday I made a, I went to the lake and I made a little wooden horse. It was pretty glorious. I made it out of sticks and stones and an old fishing line. That's pretty cool. Alright. Let me write down. Let me give you the mode roll. Do 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 well, three minutes till we we'll start. Did the horse broke your bones? I have no idea what that means. <laughs> Everything was good until the 30 minute challenge destroyed my self confidence. <laughs> uh you and me both, buddy. That's what I was gonna do. Hey, my mom is in the chat. Hello mom, I love you. <laughs> My wife is, is laughing at me. And by the way, guys, uh, I made an official post on Instagram, as usual. So uh, if it's not too much trouble, just, you know, spread the word. Repost, especially on Instagram and, I don't know, anywhere you can, please. Because, again, you guys are the main driving force behind all of it. <laughs> it's Momsha. Yep, it's Momsha. <laughs> um, okay, we have two minutes till we start. Just waiting for the slow pokes. Because it's a Wednesday, people are tired on a Wednesday. We usually get a little drop in Vikings online on a Wednesday. Slow bros. <laughs> uh, right, one minute till we start. Today's gonna be super a fun topic. I love talking about storyboarding. What else is happening in your life, guys? I see a lot of really cool diploma panels. A lot of really talented artists joined the art camp. That's pretty cool. By the way, how are how's the sound? Is it good? Can you hear me okay? No chirping in the background from uh, stupid insects. <laughs> yep, okay, all good. Nice, nice, nice. Trying to find Vin, but he's not in the chat right now, I think. Sound is good? Good. All right, we have 30 seconds till we start. checking if the mods are in the chat Ooh. 
do, 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 do. All right, one minute till we start. Oh, well, 20 seconds actually, I think. I have no idea. But soon. So your favorite Viking show. Three times a week. Without a delay. Same time. <laughs> uh, all right. It's time. It is time. Okay, so. All right. Welcome everybody to lecture number, what is it, eight? I think it's eight already. It's lecture number eight, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and today's topic is gonna be storyboarding. I'm very excited about today. And you're gonna ask why, Misha, why? Storyboarding is a whole different profession. I'm telling you guys, if you're gonna master or at least understand the storyboarding principles, your ideas, first of all, will have more structure because you'll know how to use composition and camera work and staging. And secondly, your brain is going to improve on storytelling. Why? Because you're going to imagine little movies inside your head. Today's plan is this. We're going to talk about what is camera. And we're going to have an example in form of, in form of a Mr. Cameraman. Then we're going to talk about shot types. And then we're going to talk about some rules of storyboarding and how storyboarding is done. And I'm going to show you a few examples of how we can get inspired by storyboards by having them in our brains that will dictate our images that we paint. So let's start. So what is storyboarding? Storyboarding is a sequence of images one by one, right? that when pl placed next to each other make basically a little motion comic book first the story starts with a script or an idea then a storyboard artist goes from it if you're a story artist you are your own script writer and you just you just work from a log line or just an idea of a director and for, for example um miyazaki he doesn't doesn't use a script he is a story artist, so he discovers his story through storyboards themselves. This is a little storyboard that I'll walk through. I'll give you a little pitch, and that's what storyboarders do sometimes, or all of the time. It's when you have to present your story and there's no animatics, and I'm gonna show an animatic today too. Animatic, it's when you actually have a video with some sound or without sound. But before you go into animatic stage, a storyboard artist will do a storyboard and then present it to the team with voice acting. Uh, under this video, after it's published, I'm going to give you some examples of great pitches. Uh, one of my most favorite ones is actually Genji Tartakovsky on, uh, on a series called Primal. And actually, you can find all of the episodes of Primal in a rough animatic storyboard stage narrated and pitched by Genji Tartakovsky himself. So yeah, that's a little kind of like outline what we're gonna what we're gonna tackle today. But first, right, I want to start with the main friend of a storyboard artist or a visual development artist who uses storyboarding skills. It's Mr. Cameraman. Okay, so I'm just gonna draw a little dude. Mr. Cameraman. Maybe he's going to have a little, you know, a little bow tie. You know, hello, this is Mr. Cameraman. And what does Mr. Cameraman does? He represents us, characters, and a viewer by getting close or far away from our subject matter. M main thing that we have to understand that camera is our main tool to tell our story because our, the camera represents our eye or the viewer's eye and it focuses on the, fo on the focal point, right? Focuses on the focal point, that's a lot of Fs. Um, and make sure, makes sure that the main focal point is clear 
and the story is clear and the viewer gets the main emotional aspect of it. So how do we use camera when we're just starting out an image? Let me get some water. Because I think ice cream. I already have water. Thank you. Um, I have a really good wife. She's always says, oh, can I help you? <laughs> but anyways, so what, what are the main um, shot types are out there? The main problem that a lot of um, beginner artists have is they're trying to say too many things with one shot and then they have like a character fighting here and then they have a castle there and everything goes into a mishmash, right? And then you ask them, but what did you want to say? And then he's like, well, this sword here was very important. That's what I wanted to say. And you're like, why didn't you just show the sword? And the main thing is they don't, they don't understand how framing and camera work works. So right now I'm going to go over shot types that will help you start any image. Why? Because each shot type usually reveals a certain information. In the beginning, when cameras just came out, there was no names for them. So the directors or cameramen, or we call them DPs, director of cinematography, Back in, the, back in the days, there wasn't even those titles. There was just a camera and people were like, hey, we can tell stories with it. How are we going to do that? So when they were experimenting, they're like, what if I have camera far away, right? And I need to show where, you know, where the action takes place. And they're like, okay, let's do that. Let's say we have a castle far, far away with the road and so on and so on. So this shot is called establishing shot. What do we see in the beginning of each movie? Let's say uh, the, the show Friends, for example, right? We see the main building, right? So establishing shot, what does it do? It establishes where the sequence is going to take place. And usually it's a very wide shot with a wide angle lens. And we're going to talk about lenses a little bit later. And it shows a lot of information. It shows, well, again, it's if it's a wide establishing shot, it, sh it shows a lot of, of the environment. And then where the action is going to take place. It could be a castle. It could be a room. It could be a space station. It could be a Viking hole. It could be anything. I'm making a castle for simplicity's sake, so you understand what the shot is there for. So let's call it establishing shot. Establishing shot. All right. So our Mr. Cameraman is pretty far away, you know, just for scale. Let's make him, you know, this big. So he's standing pretty far away and he, he uses a wide angle lens and he's looking at this but what if there's a you know the classic there's there's a knight on a very ugly horse that is going towards this this castle and he's he's like a little speckle a speckle can you say that a little speck a little dot somewhere in the distance so what do we do as human beings it's like what the hell is that we move closer we move closer to reveal more detail, right? So we maybe go like right here, somewhere in between an establishing shot and close up shot. It's called a medium shot. Oh, wow. So surprising. It's called a medium shot. It's right in the middle between establishing shot and a close up. So this is called a medium shot. I have no idea how to spell it. So it's either M I D or M E D, but if I misspelled it, please forgive me. <laughs> medium shot. Um, a medium shot is usually used to reveal a little bit of the environment and the character in it. But character is not close enough to spot too many details. And the character is only good as a silhouette and kind of a suggestion of detail what's 
inside of that silhouette. So for example, if we were in the castle, that means so right now we can be like here. And and he was already in uh, and he's already entering the castle. And here's gonna be the horse or the character, for example, entering the castle. That's a medium shot. I'd say there's gonna be gates here. Again, everything is gonna be very roughly drawn just for the sake of getting the point across. All right, so this is a medium shot. Medium shots, again, they're used to show a little bit closer where the character is. Still, there's a lot of information about the environment itself, but we're close enough to kind of understand who is in the shot and what character is doing in the shot. Uh, a lot of the times, medium shots are used for people walking or, uh, or pan throughs through like, a, you know, um, like a like a like a fish market for example so medium shots are pretty good with that because it shows characters close enough to the camera but still shows some of the environment all right so then let's move on to the next right and our next shots are medium close-up how surprising medium close-up and this one is an interesting shot. Why? Well, because we can see a little bit of the character now. We can see a little bit of the character now. And let's say, let's move everything closer. You know what? I'll just draw the shot like this. Or sometimes people call this shot a cowboy shot. Why? because the character is usually up to his waist and we can spot up some of his details, still a little bit of the environment around him, but it's pretty close to the character. So close that we can already see some action and interaction and maybe him talking in his gestures. So he can be talking to, I don't know, to two guards, for example, that are guarding the gate to this castle. Da, 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 da. See, medium close up. What comes after that? So see, what we're doing was just naming the positions of how close our Mr. Cameraman is to our focal point. So um, let me have another Mr. Cameraman so I can copy paste it in. So he goes even closer. So this is a medium close up, right? And there's a variation, there's like a medium wide, for example, that it's still wide enough, but I'm telling you just the basics. So you can look at your story, look at your image, or go look at other people's art and say, hmm, what kind of shot are they using? Is it an establishing shot? Is it a medium shot? See what I'm saying? That's why understanding the basics of cinematography or storyboarding is also translated very well into the visual develop development part because we are not actually painting an illustration. Well, in a way, yes, we do, but if you're talking about visual development and animation, that's what we're mostly focusing on. We're, we are painting a shot, a moment out of a narrative. So that's why for you as a biz dev person, you need to figure out your camera work and what shot you're gonna use to convince the main action. So for example, if your character is angry and super sad, you're not going to be using an establishing shot that's going to show very little character just screaming into the void because you're not going to show his facial expressions, right? And you're not going to show, you know, you're not going to use a medium shot to show an entire castle, right? Because this shot is not wide enough. It's, the camera is not far away enough. All right. So let's, let's go for, let's go further. So we have establishing shot, medium shot, and medium close-up. What comes after medium close-up? Well, close-up. And close-up is, as you understand, camera is very close now to the, to the character. And I'm using the word character, but honestly, it could be anything. It could be an object. It could be a building. It could be an environment. 
your actor that you're filming and relating the shot type to could be anything. So I'm just using the stick figure as an example, but it could be anything. Uh, so then we have a close up. Right, and close up is, as you say, you know, it's, it's a character. Now we can see his facial expressions. You know, he could be angry or he could be angry and happy at the same time. It could be anything. So close up shot is usually used to, well, <laughs> pay, pay more attention to detail. It could be expressions. It could be textures or material, it could be anything. But usually in cinematography, we pan the camera closer to who? To an actor, right? Um, and, and what I was trying to say. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to say anything. Yeah, we were trying to, we're trying to just get closer to an actor as close as possible. What, what comes after close up, right? And, you know, Let's let's have the Mr. Cameraman come even closer to our subject matter. And let's remove the castle. Or you know, put it in here. And now he's really, really close to our character, like uncomfortably. Then we have extreme close-up. And extreme close-ups are super fun. Usually it's when you need to, you know, convey some kind of super dramatic emotion and you can have, you know, the cowboy standoff shot where he's like, you know, standing with, with a grin and he's, he's prepared. Maybe he has a, you know, a cigarette, for example. Uh, it doesn't have to be a face. You can have an extreme close up to an object, like, you know, maybe like a dead hand that is shine that that is laying down in the dark, but the light is shining on the hand. Or it could be a gun. It could be it could be anything. So anything that requires extreme detail, extreme close up. That's what this shot is used for. Um, and honestly, these are the shots that you need to keep in mind, right? There's some variation in terms of like in betweens. So let's say this is the establishing shot. This is the medium shot. Um, this is medium close-up, close-up, and let's say, let's move Mr. Cameraman even closer to our actor, <laughs> and an extreme close-up, it's like, it's like, hey man, some personal space here, and then this is extreme. But there are also the names for the shots in between. So for example, establishing shot between ext establishing shot and medium shot, you can have a shot called um, medium wide shot. Why? Well, because the shot is not big enough to be an establishing shot and it's not close enough to be a medium shot. So it's something in between. It's, it's neither this, not another that. It's just, see, all of those just camera positions where Mr. Cameraman is standing are just called for convenience. Honestly, you can position your camera anyways and then try to basically come up with a name. So if it's gonna be super close to medium shot, we can be like, well, it's kind of like an establishing shot, but it could be just a medium wide shot, but it's pretty close to medium shot somewhere over there because I'm going to tell you this, even when, sto when you're working with storyboard artists or anyone else or with directors, they usually say something like that. It's like, it, it's kind of like this, but kind of like that. You Storyboard artists, you figure it out, right? But the main ones that are used is establishing shot, 
medium shot and medium close up and then close up the fourth one those are the main ones that are used in storyboarding and those are the main ones that are used in illustration so for example if we look at any art on art station right uh well for example this is a really good friend of mine antonio like here's standing a character now you can look at art through a perspective of a storyboard artist and you're like you and you start thinking what can what what mr cam where mr cameraman is standing right and if we copy this and we put it over here you know and we put it like this in the, into perspective you know mr cameraman is standing like what like right here you know pointing his thumbs up good job man very epic very cool you know he sends you something here but if he was standing over here the guy would have been what this big right if he was standing far away so why did antonio choose a medium shot well because a close-up of the guy would have been not enough why well because our camera would have not gotten the dragon in because our well we could have did kind of like a close-up like this maybe right and maybe it moved it even like this is this would have been a close-up but see this shot is not enough to convey your idea so what did he do he moved the camera farther away medium close-up um the legs are still hidden not enough space right and that's how he ended up with this kind of medium medium wide shot i would call this right so see what i'm saying just by knowing the types of shots that you have to your disposal you can very easily very easily understand where to start your painting from what camera angle to uh choose and now we're going to get to the camera angles because to summarize what i'm saying every time you're starting a shot imagine in your brain mr cameraman and mr cameraman represents you in a real life environment so when you are thinking about painting something imagine yourself as mr cameraman you know staring across you know a road and there's your friend standing on another side right and a lot of artists would say i want to show anger and i want to show a cool design of the costume of the character and then they do an establishing shot which is right here but it's not enough because it's too far away you're not going to show off emotion so what do you do as a mr cameraman or let's say you wave across the road to your friend, but you can't really see who who is standing there. You, you don't know if they're smiling or crying. You move closer, right? And then if you need to see more detail, you move even more closer. So what I'm saying is think about what you need to show first. So if it's detail, if it's emotion, if it's character design and, 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 and things a little bit more up close, move your camera closer but if you want to show action if you want to show the environment if you want to show the interaction with the environment move the camera farther away okay so i hope this helps on having at least some kind of a starting point when you start drawing any painting right because i often start with a painting and I start sketching and I, and I sketch everything too big usually and what I do is well I take everything I make it smaller and I move the camera away because I don't have enough space to show more things right and I can do that because well I'm keeping the camera in mind and I'm keeping the viewer in mind and I'm like I'm thinking what do I need to show in the shot and what I don't need to show in this shot. In our previous feedback session, the common mistake was this. 
you are trying to show too many things at the same time. You're trying to show an action, a reaction, an environment, and everything else. But camera and, 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 and staging in the camera, you can't do all of that. Because sometimes to show everything, you need to have multiple shots. You need to have an establishing shot to show where the um, where the action takes place. You need a medium shot to introduce the character a little bit closer, and then you need a medium close up or a close up to show their emotion. Sometimes it's impossible to do all in one painting. It is possible if you have enough experience because you can uh, you can um, start playing with staging, right? And staging is this, so you can have a character standing in the background, right? You can have a character standing in the middle ground and you have a character standing in the foreground. And then at the same time, you can have the environment and you can be very smart about it and position everything this way that you show the emotion up close, you show some action and you show the reaction or action and the environment at the same time. But it's really hard to combine multiple things in one shot so that's why I really strongly recommend is have your camera positioned to only, only talk about one thing at a time. Because if you're talking about too many things, just like The Incredibles, if everyone is super, no one is super. It takes a very skillful artist to be able to balance everything out. And then you have those kind of like, you know, Adam and God type of paintings where everything is all over the place and it's 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 hard to balance compositionally. So for your sake, start simple. And then when you grasp on simplicity, you can combine many shots in one because you can have an establishing shot as the background, right? And then you can have the foreground character as a medium close up, and then you can have this character as a medium shot, and then you can combine all the shots technically in one conveying different kind of emotion this character in the foreground will be talking or reacting this one is going to be doing some kind of action and at the same time we see them interacting and the environment in the background but again this is really hard it takes time to be able to balance all of those things out because you're going to have main focal point secondary focal point and then thirdly third focal point and all of them, they have, need to have an emphasis. One has to go after another. You have to be able to control your value range, color, composition. It's just too much. Okay, so we talked about the one, two, three, four, five. Five main shots, Mr. Cameraman, and why shots were called what they were called, right? So that's one thing that Mr. Cameraman can do is move forward or backwards, right? This is one movement but he also can go up or down, right? And that's when Mr. Cameraman can grow legs. Whoop, <laughs> right? He can look down at you or he can shrink a little bit, right? And look up at you. <laughs> Uh, I like using Mr. Cameraman as an example. So, why does Mr. Cameraman can go up or down? Those shots are called bird's eye view and warm eye view. So, this one is a warm. Like this. A little warm. Hello. And this is a bird's eye view or a crow's eye view, if you want to say, Kaka! right? So what are those types of shots are made for? Well, it's pretty obvious, can you guess? So the first thing is what, what the birds and, and worms eye view is to convey scale. So for example, if we're gonna use the same example as the castle, let's say we have our perspective lines like this, we can have a small character looking up at something or a mountain with flags. It could be anything, it could be epic. So a worm's eye view is usually used to convey scale. 
of an object open a character because we can just replace this character with a with just you know I'll just I'll just give them you know they can be giant robots from space ah, we'll kill you you know and see already menacing so it's either for scale or for the character to feel small right because well we are with the character in the same shot and like wow those guys are missing just remember all of those times you've been picked up and pick, picked on in school by high schoolers you look up ah, don't kill me right that's the same thing scale plus feeling feeling of being small <laughs> or insignificant of being small right a lot of the times they're used for for both right um let's let's still have a mountain here as an example so you guys still will remember it yeah so scale plus feeling small all right bird's eye view well also pretty simple a bird's eye view is used for usually pov and pov point of view it's translated as point of view so a lot of the time cinematographers will say and then we'll go we we'll cut into pov of the shark and what is pov of the shark well it's perspective of the shark imagine a shark has a, a gopro camera on top of its head so for example uh the bird's eye view can be a reverse shot of this shot so for example remember all those overloads from space are looking at our little protagonist so we can have them looking down at the little dude and be all, all epic and big and, and, and threatening right uh, we can make this shot even more dramatic if we want to and just have like a giant you know viking looking guy then a little spinky dude will say ah oh, don't kill me right so bird's eye view can be again feeling of not being small but feeling big so because a lot of the times animations will have a shot of the character feeling small but then they will have a pov point of view of of the bad guy for example looking at i don't know little jimmy let's call him right uh and that's again to feeling of not being small but now being big or show that this guy is small compared to this guy also it's very convenient that it's a bird's eye view bird's eye view is used for what well again scale you can be on top of a giant building you know like remember all of those uh, spider-man into the Sp spider-verse um shots where you had just buildings going down into the perspective and then you have a and then you have like a character looking down at everything right and there's like cars beep beep so bird's eye view is also there for convincing scale it could be anything it could be a city it could be you standing on top of a tower on top of a mountain and again you use again scale and or scale or height i have no idea how to spell height scale or height or again feeling feeling of being big so for example instead of being threatening you can actually have just you know a character's pov looking over the valley for example and the character is like yes i'm the boss you know it, he's just standing on top of the mountain and he's like yep i'm the boss and and the camera is shooting behind him and you'll get you'll get a shot like this right so that's another thing so again let's recap Establishing shot is for where where the action is going to take place. Medium shot is show a little bit closer where the action is taking place. Medium shot or medium close up is showing even closer the faces, the designs, the reactions, the interactions. Close up usually for dialogue and emotion. An extreme close up for extreme things. A close up to a detail. A close up of a map. A close up of an angry smoking face of a cowboy right so and the general rule of thumb if you need to show detail move closer to your object and if you need to see 
everything at the same time move farther away. Um, and then camera angles, worm eye view and bird's eye view. Both are used for scale of either, I feel so small compared to this giant or a, or a mountain, you know, character versus the environment or character versus, I like to call it David, David and Goliath shot, for example. I, I, you know, let's call it that. David and Goliath, DA shot. <laughs> um, and it's used for scale and feeling small because there's a reason why I said Mr. Cameraman. Why? Because um, we are the cameraman or the viewer is the cameraman. You need to feel small with the cameraman or big with the cameraman. Because here we can be the protagonist, that's the camera of the protagonist, the POV, the point of view of the protagonist. And this is gonna be the POV of the antagonist, right? So Mr. Cameraman just switches places with those people. And then when you're gonna be doing your own shots, you're like, okay, is it an establishing shot? Cool. Do I wanna show a sense of scale? Maybe I'll move the camera down because I wanna show how high compared to the character the mountain is. Or I want to do an upshot to show how far he will have to fall. So see, this is how you can use just camera angle um, to convey scale or being big or being small or the feeling that the main character is gonna, gonna have in the shot. Uh, another thing is like, you know, there's, there's a few things like over the shoulder shot this is a little bit more specific to storyboarding itself, but over the shoulder shot is usually when you have a character talking and then you have another character here. And then you have, let's say this is character A and this is character B. This is me going a little bit too in depth into the storyboarding aspect of it. But let's say if this character is talking, blah, 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 and he's staying on the left, of the of, of the camera when we're gonna cut so there's gonna be two cameras that's why it's called over the shoulder shot because the camera is shooting over the shoulder of this guy and then there's gonna be another camera over the shoulder of this guy and then when this guy is stopped talking this guy starts talking and when we cut and then we reverse the roles like this but instead of A. So instead of B, this is gonna be A, and this is gonna be B. No, this is gonna be B, and this is gonna be A. So if you guys, let's say, gonna be doing keyframes based on dialogue, for example, and you wanna do a reverse shot, there's a camera, there, there's a rule that if a, if a character starts on the left, and then the next shot that you can choose, this character A should still stay on the left because if he's if 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 the character is gonna change positions with this guy, it's gonna be too confusing. So it's it's I think it's called a one eighty degree rule. So if two characters are standing here and the camera is here. Every time you cut to this guy or you do any in-between shots, so let's say this is the in-between shots here, here, and here, the camera cannot go, may not go here. It can only go here. There's an exception to this rule, but you don't need to know it. Why? Because we're not storyboard artists. I'm already telling you a little bit too much about storyboarding. This is not gonna be very useful, but give it a notice. Go watch a movie and see the 180 rule be in practice because people gonna stay on the same side of course if there's going to be multiple people then the rules change and honestly even i don't quite understand how it all works um so i'm just giving you the basics all right what else do we need to know about storyboarding there's one useful thing that I always use when I am just starting out a shot. And many people call it different things. I call it Lego, Lego table layout. 
I draw a table, and before I start even thinking about what I wanna, what shot I want to use, I just draw a little layout like this. So, for example, let's say I want to do a shot of a of a mountain range, you know, and there's a house, and maybe there's a character standing, and maybe there's a dragon, you know, just attacking this this house and it's Davaki, and then pretty soon he's gonna say Pusroda. Da, 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 right so what i'm gonna do i'm gonna paint the whole uh, i'm just gonna do a rough layout like this right and i call it my lego table and i'll just place all of the pieces on this little simple table that took me like what five seconds to to write down right in the background i'll do like a little plane and i'm gonna say mountain's gonna be here like a green screen almost right and after that i'm gonna be like maybe there's gonna be a few trees here maybe there's gonna be like a giant rock here maybe other dudes are coming to the aid of this guy and then what i'm gonna do i'm gonna invite mr cameraman i'm gonna be like all right where's he gonna be standing is he gonna be standing over here right just like a giant slender man you know but then what what what, what we're going to see? We're just going to see this, right? We're just going to see a little bit of the character, the house and the dragon, but we're not going to see those guys. So then I'm going to be like, "Aha. Uh -huh. This doesn't really work for me." So what where do we we're going to move Mr. Cameraman? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to move him here and he's going to be like sitting down. But then those guys are still not in the shot, right? But this shot is a little bit more epic. Why? because we're gonna show how big the dragon is. So then I will do like a little arrow from let's say this cameraman and I'll do a little layout. So how would it look? So there's gonna be a hill, right? There's the houses over there and the dragon attacking it. And then the main character is standing in the foreground, for example, right? This is camera one, for example. And I'm like, mm, you know what? This is okay, but let's try something else. And then maybe, maybe because another thing you have to understand, Mr. Cameraman also can fly. <laughs> uh, and he's he can just be standing here and just looking down. So, and then after a while, after I just think about the layout like this, because right now I don't have to really do those kind of things out loud uh, or on the canvas itself. I can do the same thing in my head directly uh, because, well, I have a lot of experience and with experience, you are just like Sherlock Holmes can do things in your mind. But if it helps you, this is one of kind of like a pre-visualization uh, exercises before you even start doing this. Of course, you can start just, you know, just sketching, but this is like a director's way to show where to place your Mr. Cameraman. Another thing is you can do the same thing with lighting. You're like, okay, we're gonna put Mr. Lighting Man or Mr. Lightbulb, you know? There's gonna be another character that we're gonna have, we're gonna use for sure. Um, you know, is he gonna be an area light guy or it's gonna be a direct light standing somewhere, right? And then you can just plan all of those things like a real director, like on the real set. You guys are going to tell you this. I don't want to go too much ahead because we're going to talk about staging and lighting later on in the lectures. But this, it's called, again, Lego table <laughs> logo. Lego, Lego table um, approach. And honestly, it really sometimes saved my my butt from, you know, from frustration because I would be just thinking about everything two dimensionally like this on a piece of canvas. But when you're doing this, you're, you're expanding your brain. You're, you're becoming, it's 4D chess this, <laughs> this time. And it's really, it, it's really, really useful. So please, if you're having trouble and you're like, I have no idea what shot to use. Yeah, plan everything like this and then 
try to put the camera in and then, and then and then ask yourself is it a medium shot is it an establishing shot is it a close-up right how close do i need to be to my character or how far away i can be from my character sorry again we have a crazy scientist duels here <laughs> uh yeah so what are the other things that i wanted to talk about today honestly i just want to go straight up into examples and I want to show a little storyboard that I made and I can do a little pitch for you. Um, and after I do my pitch, I'm going to show other people's pitches. And then we're going to analyze a few paintings from our station and see where Mr. Cameraman is standing and what shot they're using. All right, guys, uh, I haven't shown this to anyone yet. So this is pretty, pretty exclusive specifically for you. Um, and this is a little storyboard that I did for my Lumber Saga, one of the stories. This is a little teaser trailer. Um, and yeah, let's dive in. Um, before I start, this is one of the thing that storyboard people do. Just in the beginning, I said they work with a script or they work without a script. I'm a story artist. I work without a script. So this whole thing started very very rough it started like this and i'll show you later on how i was planning all my compositions we have a lot of examples examples ahead so i will try to be brief uh there's going to be a lot of noises so brace yourselves get your popcorn uh this is the first viewing of of the storyboard all right imagine water going shh Viking music, whoa, yo, 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 yo. the camera pans up, Ooh, weird things on the gate, mm, Vikings, uh, carvings of Vikings fighting a beast, Vikings, you know, fighting more beasts, and then we have a medium shot of the entire gate, and all the details are together, there's beautiful carvings of Viking stuff, and camera goes up, it goes up, it goes up, it goes up, and there's a lonely Viking standing with fire torches, water chirping from the background, and he's, he's looking into nowhere and just breathing out cold air. You know, the fire torches go whoosh, whoosh. We pan up, we are floating above the water gate, Torches are still going. The moon is reflecting. The water goes underneath the gate, and then we and then we cut to an establishing shot because I wanted to show the entire um, the entire environment first from detail, and then show where it is. So still, you know, water going everywhere, and, and the moon is reflecting, and it's very little speckle of a dude standing on top of the gate. Then we cut to a medium shot or a medium close-up shot or a close-up shot of a Viking dude just standing and, and the wind is going whoosh. he's breathing, he's all epic and stuff and then he hears a whistle from far away he goes, huh? who's there? Mm. and then we see on one of uh, on the left side of his face we see interesting technological tattoos that don't belong to a Viking world and then we see you know, footsteps from far away with a torch. Boom, 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 boom. It's a, it's a giant dude just going. Dish, dish, dish. They look at each other. He raises his torch. Hmm. They look at each other. And then he's like, eh? He brings a little bag, throws it. Whoosh. He goes, Doink. it's a nice piece of chicken with the bread. He looks at it. Still a little bit grumpy because he scared him. And he goes, ah, chicken, <laughs> very nice. And then he turns around and goes, chick, 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 and stand um, uh, with his little stick thing. And then something happens. His tattoos start glowing. Whoa, yeah, yeah, yeah. He hears something from the background. And then we even get to extreme close up to show how important it is. And then whoosh, fire torch goes, shoo. a shadow goes, whoo with the embers from the torch in front of his legs. The next shot is like, oh, something is reflecting red in his eyes. And he looks at this guy and he shows his body. He's like, oh no, his their tattoos are glowing. Heartbeat music. 
Duk duk. Duk duk. He looks up. <gasps> What's in there? A shadow goes across his face. The, the torch goes. And then he looks up. Weird shadow silhouettes go over the moon. And go beyond the wall. He's like. <gasps> Match cut with another guy. Oh no. Stuff is about to get real. He. He's like, Ugh. he gets angry, he takes his spear, gets it up, puts it down, uh, puts it on the ground, gets his epic Viking horn, the the music goes do 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 or like from the from the Skyrim. Oh yo yo he goes do do the A giant snake just just dissimulates him going Whoa, like a giant train. Just Blood everywhere. Ah! The guy looks. Oh, ah, what happened? Oh no! And then the only thing that we get is just standing legs, just and when the fire goes, shh, 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 and splash, and then slowly goes, shh, shh, splat, and then a giant, an arm goes, boom, with the battle horn in front of the camera, super close up. The guy goes, things are on. He throws his torch away. Do, 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 Takes the horn. Takes the chicken. Jumps over, over the wall. Do, 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 Gets, gets, gets on the boat. Pushes a button. It's a Viking boat. The eye of the Drakkar starts shining. Anti-gravity engines of a Viking boat start turning on. The engine opens up. Then he goes, whoa. He goes into into the darkness. A giant, uh, a giant horde of things start jumping over the wall. The next one is like, get into the water. He's shout, uh, he's going left, right to avoid them. He keeps the chicken in his mouth. Takes a bite. Right. He he chews it, and then we cut to POV of the of the fish. Something is swimming towards him. And then he jumps. It's in the air. He's still chewing. And then he goes to take another bite. And then a giant monster of fish just takes the chicken away from his hand. He's like, oh, what happened? And he goes. He gets angry. <laughs> <laughs> and the piece of his arm is also gone <laughs> with the chicken. And if there's a bone sticking out. He's like, ah! he's really angry now. He pulls a lever. He starts yelling. Aah! You know, the Drakkar's head of the Viking bull starts turning around. <laughs> there's like a uh, lighter, lighter uh, getting assembled um, sounds. And then a fire goes. Whoa! Giant, uh, amazing Viking music going on, and then he goes, and then he goes into super sonic skit. And then we all can, we can hear his sound from a, from a distance as he going towards the shore, and there's little fire torches, uh, fire torches uh, light up in the distance. He's going Valhalla! from far away and then we cut to the people on on the beach and it's just quiet Shh. embers go and they're talking and then the guy takes a piece of fish and then he hears like in the distance and he thinks it's nothing because he doesn't hear it so then we cut back to the to the epic the the music is going full metal boom 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 he's fr <laughs> he's frying his hand <laughs> on the torch of a anti-gravity drakkar and he's just frying it's just barbecue Whoa, shh. he takes it down he's so badass he doesn't care he needs to warn his buddies he takes the battle horn that he took from the from the dead body dead body of his and he goes Doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo. we cut back to the uh to the shot uh, that I didn't replace, and he's he's holding he's holding it with the wrong arm, but doesn't matter. And then he says, "Fish are coming!" And then with his voice, the camera pans out, "Fish are coming!" And then we cut back to the people eating. 
at, at the fireplace. And then he's like, oh. He turns around. Only the moon is reflecting his eyes. They stand up. And then all their tattoos start glowing red. And slowly, but surely, other tattoos in the background also start glowing up. There's a huge Viking army with glowing tattoos. And then it, cu it cuts to black. Title, Fisherman Died the End. Ta-da! So, what I did right now is I showed you a little storyboard that I did. It's, a, it's about a three-minute animation. I have an animatic, but it's rough. Uh, this is Welcome to the Viking, uh, the Lumber Saga world. The teaser that I just showed you for, it was teaser for Fisherman Die at the End. So if you really like, if you like this, you know, uh, hope you'll stay for longer to see more things. But now we're going to go over it. Not one more time, but I'm going to show you the shots that I used. So see, same thing. What is this shot? I need to show the facial expression of the guy. This could be a keyframe, right? But I'm not showing anything else because the only thing that I need to show is fear, right? But when I need to show a character in the environment, I'm using a medium shot. But if I want to show the entire environment, I'm using an establishing shot. So see, a lot of the times when I am thinking about my story, what am I doing? This will sound crazy, but this is what you, you have to imagine all of this in your head and press play in your head. But then when you like a moment that you like, press pause, take that moment and paint the creep frame. That's how your brain should work. Because I don't want you to think about your story in, here's a singular image, and I'm going to paint it. No. Imagine all of this, and then paint one painting or three paintings. Okay? So, what I'm saying is, as visual development artist, you are a storyboard artist in your head first, and then you're a visual development artist when you are actually painting. But... You need to have some kind of a story or a storyboard or a sequence in your head to make it look convincing, right? And there's many other uh, storyboard pitches, but I don't want to take too much of the time. I didn't, I didn't know that my pitch will take so long. Last time I did it was, it wasn't that long. But what I'm gonna say is, now as you saw the pitch, I'm gonna show you the same pitch. Look at those doodles. What is this shot? <laughs> this is this is this shot. Does it look the same? No. Does it look the same in my head? Yes. Okay. Next shot. <laughs> this one. What is this? It's this shot. Okay. What about um, <laughs> this shot? Right. Him turning around. This is this shot. Okay. See any difference? I know. I don't. But what I'm trying to show you guys is everything starts simple, weird, and sketchy. Do not like see this is <laughs> this is him being killed. And this is doink. This is the shot with the hand, right? I, I, I drew it more you know defined and looks more epic. It's still pretty rough, but this the idea is there. What I want to convince to you guys. Or, for example, this Spankadurus. Look at this. This is the epic ending shot. See? To me, this is the same thing. Why? Because I am roughly taking the camera. It's a medium shot. I know what the staging is because staging is absolutely the same. A little bit different, but almost the same. Right? The guy on the right and the left and the middle. That's it. So what I'm saying is... Don't be precious with your ideas or your sketch lines. Do, do not be tidy. Loosey goosey. That was a lot of slang words in one, in one second. Be rough. And the rougher you are, better you are. Because if your idea is good, you will see the final painting. Like, see, look, that's him looking into the sky, right? 
and here's the shot of him looking into the sky, right? Same thing, same simple statement. Where's my camera guy standing? Right here, looking up. Why? Because I need to show how high up those creatures are and they're above him. And he feels small compared to them and scared, right? But idea was in this little doodle. So when you're doing your big keyframes, right? You do not have to be super clean, right? So for example, I'm gonna show you this little story. This one is in three frames. I'm probably gonna do it this is probably my three keyframes that I'm gonna paint for this camp. Um, then before I did the storyboard, by the way, I'm just gonna go a little bit. This this is the designs of the Vikings that I wanted to do. Um, and for example, this is the storyboard slash color script that I did for the teaser. It's also very, very rough and gets the, gets the story across. But what I'm trying to say is story first, camera supports your story, type of shot, supports your story and then sketchy lines will establish your story and then rendering everything else you're going to capitalize on your great thinking on your understanding how everything works and it's going to be great and epic and super awesome so let me introduce you to another story i have many animatics like this but i'm not going to show because i don't want to spoil um or do you do i want to spoil all right maybe i'll show one more do you guys want one more? I can show you one more little, little animation short. This time it's going to be with sound. Um, it was roughly storyboarded by me, but then it was clean up, uh, well, cleaned storyboarded by a friend of mine called uh, Edward Kurczewski. He's a super talented storyboard flash. Well, he's mainly an animator. But I'm gonna show you this little animation that we did with him a really long time ago, and we haven't really showed it officially, so this is gonna be the first time. Hopefully, you'll hear the sound. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty little, pretty small, uh, you know, but it was a proof of concept. And then we expanded on it a little bit, and this is another storyboard. It's going to be part of it. But what I'm trying to say is that storyboarding and love for storyboarding should really be one of your priorities as, um, you know, as storytellers, you need to love animation. You need to love storyboarding. You need to love the craft and imagine all of this in your brain and then paint one painting. So for example, another little three sequences, uh, I was like, because in my world, the Vikings are with technologies. I'm thinking, what about power tattoos? They're gonna actually give actual supernatural powers to the vikings and if you don't know in the, in the viking age there's such thing as the blood eagle and i'm like well the blood eagle was an execution but what if there was really long time ago when an alien ship crashed a droid who was doing like wires and circuitry of robots went loose and then they discovered them and then he started doing tattoos on Vikings who connected their neurons and muscles in a weird way. And then if, let's say, berserkers, they wanted to you know, take away uh, their, their sense of fear, they just get a berserker tattoo that 
you know, eliminates the fear hormone in, in their brain and, and so on, so on, so on. So then with this idea, I came up with this interesting moment. So, you know, just imagine gates opening and then, and then the Vikings go, whoa, 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 yo, 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 you know, just, you know, stumping with the, with the, uh, with their, with their spears, whoa, 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 yo, whoa, whoa. you know, and this guy is coming. And we, is, is it an oracle? Is it a weird kind of guy? I don't know. And then it opens up. Watch. Different mechanical hands, and they're made out of wood and metal and uh, out of old portraits of old uh, Viking rulers. He comes to it and he gets chained up. And then this thing's just, you know, drops uh, its cape down and then starts tattooing. Like a, like a little spider. And then all the Vikings, they go, whoa, and, and then I don't know what's going to be next. See, but probably what's going to happen. He's going to survive through the thing. And he's going to become super powerful and they're going to open the gates and we'll go into battle of this Viking hole. Um, but what I'm saying is when I'm creating keyframes, I'm thinking about a whole storyboard in my head and then I'm pausing on main moments that I want to see that will convey the story and I paint those moments. And if I need more moments, I paint more. So how do you practice storytelling skills? How do you practice storyboarding? I, I say, and perception of those shots. I say, find your best or favorite animation. And this is what I actually did on my free time when I was studying things. This is a little animation short by Gendy Tartakovsky. He did uh, an intro to the priest um, movie. And what I did, I screenshotted everything by hand and I named every shot. This was a close up. Then this was a pan down into a medium shot. And then there was a pan down and it match cut with, there was like a little Dracula thing and a match cut with, uh, with the moon. But this is for me as a director and cinematographer. And I, I, I usually look for different things like screen direction of animation and camera work. You guys, or we as visual development artists, we don't deal with movement. We don't deal with match cuts. We deal with big moments. But it's really helpful for you to understand how storyboarding works in depth. And I really encourage everyone to dive deep into what editing is, right? What the basics of animation are. Why? Well, what do we need to know animation, Misha? Well, let's, for example, let's see. Let's say you have a, you have, you have a guy punching a monster. You can either draw, uh, you know, a wind up, of that, of that uh, punch, you know, or you can draw an in between of that punch, or you can draw a what you call it, an actual punch. And how is it gonna help me? Well. What do you want to convey with the moment? Is it, and then what you can do is, right? You can have a little animation. Let's, let me do all of this like this. So now you can think of, and this is pretty rough, but you can think of your character as a living, breathing thing. And you can think, all right, if he's just winding up, that means the things is about to happen. You know, crap is about to hit the fan. He's like in the middle of the punch. It's like, whoa, it's, 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 it's just happening. But this things are on, right? And let's say there's like a creature here just going, bah! you know? So what I'm trying to say is more things, you know, about cinematography, animation, I don't know, history, anything, all of this will benefit your storytelling skills. Because we will go, this is a little bit related more to gesture, probably more than storyboarding, but storyboard artists, they're really good at gesture and they can pick out like, this is the rule of one, two, three, anticipation, action, and kind of an overshoot. Um, 
yeah, or wind up, then action. So what I'm saying is study those things. So first, let's recap what you need to remember. First, the types of shots, where's cameraman is standing, close or far away, and why? Is he sitting down? It's an angle, is it a low angle? Is he standing up? Is it a high angle? Is he flying? Right, you know what? Just for the sake of presentation, let's have a what's that? Let's have a flying cameraman. Or yeah, camera. Mr. Camera. Alright, just flying, just looking at you. Right. Uh think about your story in a storyboarding way, right? Think about your actions. Think about the character's motivation. Have this, all of this. Have it in the back of your mind and then press pause. Press pause and take your main keyframes. Have music in mind, have the feeling in mind. Remember, there's a reason why I'm making all of those noises when I'm lecturing you, okay? You know, there's, there's a reason why I'm making all of those noises. It's because I am in the moment and I'm trying to get this moment to you as much as possible, right? That's why I gave you a little presentation of my storyboard. Because when you are thinking about your own story, you have to do this basically to yourself. Or you can, you know, pitch your keyframe to another person. That's why I think there's a lot of things that we need to borrow from storyboarding and then incorporate into our work, um, into our work pipeline. Um, yeah, and as a wrap, I'll just give you, again, a little bit more of examples of, of the establishing shots. So Iron Giant, what is this shot? An establishing shot, why? It's showing up where the, the action is gonna take place. What is this shot? This is kind of like, almost like an establishing shot, but more of a medium shot, probably, because we can see all of them, we can see a little bit of environment. So this is an M, a medium shot. This is an E, an establishing shot. What's this? Well, this is kind of like medium close-up. This is a close-up. This is an extreme close-up, right? What is this? This is a this is a high angle, um, medium shot, or medium wide shot. This is a this is a low angle, medium wide shot plus minus, right? And one of your homeworks will be as an extra to your three keyframes, because you have to understand we're still doing this, those three keyframes. If you want to go and watch a movie or go on the art station and just try to do this exercise, right? What is this? This is an establishing shot, right? What about this? Also an establishing shot. What about this? This is a medium shot. What about this? Medium close-up shot. What about this? Close-up shot, right? Because we can imagine. So let's say this is, this is Moses. And Prince of Egypt is one of my favorite movies of all time. And this is Moses. And we just imagine Mr. Cameraman just, you know, creepily and slowly, you know, <laughs> approaching him. Uh, yeah, so this is a close-up. This is a, this is an extreme close-up, right? Because he falls asleep and then it cuts to the, um, the stone wall drawing version of him. So extreme close-up. And then same thing. High angle. Um, I say it's a medium shot. Right, and in a low angle, medium wide shot, probably medium wide shot. And see, we don't have to be storyboard artists, we just need to understand how shots work. And then, when you get an idea, like for example, a knight fighting a monster, right? Just an idea, what do you do next? You think, all right, is the monster big? If it's big, sure. Let's, let's probably use, you know, like a wide shot or an establishing shot to show how freaking big the monster is. Or maybe, maybe we'll do a medium shot uh, from a warm eye view because we need to show how, how little the knight is compared to the monster. See, even before we start painting, the knowledge of the shots will give us context of where to start, where to place our camera. And again, if you're super confused and you're still exploring, you still can do the Lego 
the Lego table approach. And it's going to be pretty awesome. So yeah, that's storyboarding 101 for you guys. The only thing that we didn't cover is probably uh, lenses. And honestly, here's the rule of thumb for lenses. Uh, lenses don't really matter for us. Uh, we don't really need to know the name of them. It's just basically the rule is if there's more background that you can see um, of the character and the wider the lens is and more stuff you need to show, more curved your lines of perspective will be. So say if this is a temple, you know, there's almost going to be kind of like a fisheye lens, but you're going to show a lot of the environment. And then narrow it goes. This is this is the lens. Uh, less the curvature of of the perspective is going to be and flatter the uh, the shot is going to look. So I think wide angle lenses start from 17 millimeters and they can and then for the narrowest one, they can for the flattest one it's going to be like 200 millimeters. But this is information that honestly is useless to you because your rule of thumb is I just need to show more of the environment, right? So you just make the canvas wider and the, and the lines are going to be more curved. That's it. And then less of the environment you show, they're just going to be a little bit straighter. And, and yeah, that's it. I'm going to, I'm going to link you a good video on camera lenses. If you want to dig even deeper, right? But when you're a beginner, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't overload your mind with what kind of camera lenses they are because it's just going to be too much. Um, whatever I said should be enough for you. So yeah, um, to recap again, types of shots, where the cameraman stands, closer you need to be to an object to reveal detail, closer the cameraman, camera, <laughs> Mr. Cameraman is. Use the Lego table approach to um, plan out your scene. If you don't know what shot to choose and plot your lighting to just by, you know, just putting light bulbs and directional arrows, right? Think about your angles. What do you want to show? Scale, is it high up or is it too, too low to fall into? Uh, is it threatening, unthreatening, blah, 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 blah. And think about story. Have the storyboard in, in the back of your head and run it nonstop and then press pause, choose the moment and then paint it by using the theory of the cameraman, Mr. Cameraman. And that's it. It's super easy, guys. Story first, questions, what I want to say, what I want the audience to feel. And then Mr. Cameraman is there to help you out, to emphasize your simple statement, to emphasize your emotion and to emphasize your story. But again, story comes first. Without a story, without emotion, your camera cannot emphasize your story and your shot type and composition cannot emphasize it. Uh, in terms of composition, layout and everything else, we're gonna go deeper into that when I'm gonna be doing a keyframe demo and I'm going to be explaining uh, the illustration process because I want to keep the lectures a little bit simple and shorter. So you just get this one lesson and don't overload your brain with too much information. So yeah, I hope you like this little lecture. I personally love storyboarding. I have a lot of unrevealed storyboards that I haven't showed yet in animatics. Um, yeah. Hope you guys liked it. Um, just keep in mind, story first. And as usual, we're going to have a Q&A session afterwards in our Discord channel for people who missed it. Too bad. Don't miss the live. <laughs> don't, don't miss the live streams because we speak for another hour, hour and a half, usually just in the voice. But anyways, uh, you Vikings are amazing. Thank you for coming to the lecture. I'm proud of you. You're doing great progress. I see each and one of you and your diplomas and your progress and your 30 minutes death challenge doodles. And it's just amazing. 
So yeah, that's it for today. Stay hydrated, be the epic Viking that you can be, and we'll talk to you in on Friday. On Friday, we have a great guest, David Cunningham, an actual script writer who knows how the story works, and it's going to be epic and awesome. Please don't miss it. So yeah, that's it for today, and skull, everybody. Bye, y'all.